Our next department is city commissioners. Identify yourself in person. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, President Dale Clark, <laughs> uh, Chairman Bill Greenlee, who's chairing, and members of City Council. I'm Anthony Clark, Chairman of the City Commissioners. Joining me here today is Commissioner Al Smith. Uh, City Commissioner Lisa Daly, Department Administrator Greg Irving, and Budget Officer Valerie Crawford Keys. I am pleased to provide testimony on the City's Commissioner's official year 2017 operating budget. Our proposed official year general fund budget totals $9,678,000 a decrease of 160,000 from fiscal year 2016 estimated obligation our proposed budget includes 5,639,000 in class 100 an increase of 14,542 over FY16 estimated obligation which will pay for increase to staff payroll, three million four hundred and ninety-seven thousand, and class two hundred, which qualifies F five, FY sixteen estimated obligation, four hundred and seventy-five thousand in class three hundred, a one hundred and seventy-five thousand decrease from FY sixteen estimated obligation. 67,000 in class 400, which is equal to our FY16 estimated obligation. Al? Our employee demographic breakdown as of January 2016 is 52 white, 37 African American, five Hispanic, and one other, of whom 28 are female. The mm -hmm. department has five bilingual employees who are fluent in Spanish. Since 2000, January 2016, our department has now hired four African-American employees, three white employees, and three of the seven new employees are female. Mm -hmm. Over the last four years, we've succeeded in increasing the number of African-American employees in our department by 25%. The department has significantly increased the ethnic diversity of our workforce. We remain committed to improving employment opportunities to people of all ethnic backgrounds. Our goal over the next year is to add at least one additional bilingual employee and to improve our male to female ratio while improving or maintaining our ethnic diversity. The city commissioners have worked with the Office of Human Resources to create new career paths for our employees, one clerical and one technical. This, along with improvements to the diversity of our staff, will result in more supervisory opportunities to employees of all backgrounds. Our department's OEO goal for MWDBE contracts is 25%. Our department's current level is 31%. And we continue to work to improve it further. For example, we provide information on all our department contracts to the African American, Hispanic, and Asian American Chambers of Commerce in an effort to increase our participation rate. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Dealey. There are a few initiatives not budgeted for which we still seek to implement during this upcoming fiscal year. Election board pay. Election board officials play an important role in ensuring the proper conduct of elections in each of our 1,686 divisions. 
With the increasing complexity of the election code, finding workers who are willing to work every election is important. An increase in election board pay will help increase retention rates and morale. Currently, if election board workers attend training, they receive $125 or $130 for a 14 to 15 hour day plus 30 to 45 minutes of training. We know that a dramatic increase in pay may not be possible. However, we have found that small incremental increases are more manageable. We would like to increase board worker pay by at least $15 for all board workers, including our bilingual interpreters, over the course of the, new, of the two fiscal years. An increase of $5 in fiscal year 2017 will cost the city approximately $87,000 per fiscal year. We are also interested in creating a new mobile app to make it even easier for voters to access important election information on election day, such as their polling place, a sample ballot, and for them to submit issues. This is the next step in our modernization efforts, which began with the launch of the Commissioner's new website in 2013. We sent postcards to every voter in Philadelphia prior to the primary election in April. This was necessary to make sure infrequent and new voters are able to find their polling place in this year's busy election cycle. The commissioners would like to do this prior to every presidential primary and general election, and prior to every special election not being held at the same time as the primary or general election. The estimated cost to send postcards prior to the 2016 general election is $350,000 of which the department will be able to use $90,000 in HAVA funds. In closing, we'd like to thank the dedicated staff of our department for their hard work, and again, thank City Council for the opportunity to testify today. We welcome any questions. Done. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, got a couple of questions. So on um, page five of your testimony shows the number of election board workers targeted to increase in FY17. For the page 16, it shows the poll workers' payroll being reduced by 134. Council President, can you can you cite where you which pages you got this from again? Yeah, on in your testimony on page five shows the number of election board workers targeted to increase in FY17. But on page 16 of your budget detail, it shows a poor workers' payroll being reduced by 134. I know that we have three. Oh. Okay. So it, it, it's because we'll be looking for a mid-year transfer to help uh, cover those costs as we have in, in previous fiscal years. This was Valerie Crawford Keith, who's our, who's our budget, budget officer. She wants to speak? Yeah. Come on, Val. State your name for the record. Ms. Keith. Valerie Crawford Keith, Budget Officer, City Commissioner's Office. We, um, in the fiscal year 17, we won't have the HAVA grant anymore. So we're going to request during the mid year transfer, we will need additional funding in Class 200. So um, that's why during, that's why in the budget it was decreased because we will need those additional fund, funds. Yeah. So you plan on coming to see us again? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. Because, like a lot of these things, there. Is that grant that we're losing? Okay. What's the name of the grant? HAVA. Where is that from? Help America Vote Act. Yeah. Oh. So we won't have it in fiscal year 17, so we'll need additional funding in Class 200. Oh, okay. We've been drawing down, Council President, we've been drawing down on that account since its creation, and the money is available in, in different buckets. 
available for different purposes, okay. what, like wheelchair accessibility or pulling, uh, pull worker training or things like that. And that, that amount has continued to decrease. And some of those, um, some of those dedicated sources are, are expended or, you know, um, ex expended. Um, we continue to work with the Department of State. For example, we received additional funding to mail out these postcards in the primary, which we think were very successful in helping to increase voter turnout and, more importantly, to help make sure that registered voters know where they're supposed to show up to vote on Election Day. Uh, especially in a presidential election year, we have a lot of new voters. We have a lot of people who haven't voted in a while, so mm -hmm. their polling places may have moved. Mm -hmm. We're able to use, we ha have been able to use uh, HAVA funding to offset those costs, and in talking to the Department of State the other day, we were able to appeal for additional resources not dedicated to Philadelphia County, but are still available to the state of Pennsylvania. So we're looking for outside sources all the time, especially HAVA grant funding, to cover our costs. Mm -hmm. It's just until we get them, we can't, okay. we can't budget them in. Okay. Um, you recently began allowing citizens in the state to register or change addresses online. Have you had an opportunity to analyze the change, the increased registration opportunities, or has it been more successful in keeping track, or how, how, that, how has that impacted this whole has, they're, they're, they, They've just rolled this out, right? So it's, so it's going through, there's some bumps along the way. And one of the things that we saw that was a challenge on the, on the front end of the, the program was people were registering online, but they weren't submitting their signature. Right. Either now electronically, which wasn't available at first, or in, in the form that they send in. So that caused a little bit of trouble. This is a Department of State issue. It's not a Philadelphia County issue, but it's something on the ground that we saw. Right. Because uh, HAVA is... Um... Please pull the mic up. Oh. Of course, uh, what we do is uh, when that stuff is submitted, we submit it to Harrisburg. You know, and so we have to wait for Harrisburg to give us the count. Okay. The, the whole voter registration system is centralized uh, in Pennsylvania. So we all, every county depends on the statewide oh, okay. uniform so registry of electors. States. That's right. Yes, sir. We do have state. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> let me address the elephant in the room. <laughs> all right. So there has been a significant amount of controversy around the commissioner's office and certain aspects of the elected officials, the whole nine yards. And there have been conversations from a number of people, and I've talked to you all about personally some of the concerns that I've had, and I understand that there was a series of meetings internally among the commissioners, and there was various recommendations from both, you know, all of the members as it relates to some reforms within the departments. Can you give me the status of those reforms as it relates to the city commissioner's office in terms of what has been submitted and what's been adopted, what continues to be a part of the conversation? We initially rolled out um, regulations in the department in 2013. And a lot of this has been a matter of building, building on what we already had, as it applies to all of us, as to our commitment to our, um, our, um, our mission and the, the roles that we each play in, in that mission. Um, it's been, I think, frustrating for, for all of us uh, over the last couple of months because right, our job is to run elections, and we have to keep our eye on the goal because we, there's no redo, right? Mm -hmm. So for the primary election, with a, an expected huge increase in voter turnout, we haven't been answering all of those calls that we've read about, uh, more or less the same article in the Inquirer right. repeatedly. Right. Um, whether they are accurate or, or in, in many cases, not. Because really, it's all about staying focused on making sure Election Day runs smoothly. Right. It's, a, I think, a, a frustrating thing for us to deal with, but we can't allow ourselves to be distracted by, by noise in the background and, and groups that, however may well-intentioned, don't really know what they're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me make it clear. I don't want to take up all the time. So 
I, as much or more than anybody, respect the independently elected officials' office. I right. genuinely believe in that. Mm -hmm. I have concerns about merit selection as it relates to judges, and I believe that at the end of the day, people had a responsibility to uh, elect a person, and they had the responsibility to unelect a person. And I genuinely believe in that. And as an independently elected official, and then subsequently, my friends and colleagues, you know, asked me to sit up here right. doing budget hearings as the council president. From time to time, there needs to be changes. As an example, um, this issue with respect to public comment. And I got to tell you, we didn't ask for the change, but they made us, you know, have a public comment before every bill. And I still don't agree with it because we have public hearings. <laughs> unlike the smaller counties, I mean, they they pretty much show the agenda and vote, and that's why that was changed. Um, with respect to some of our budgeting process, we revised some of the budget, budgeting process to make it more transparent. Um, mm -hmm. We actually created neighborhood budget hearings, which we didn't do in the past, so we actually went to people and said, you can come around the corner to see yourself. Um, we created an ethics officer internally. Um, resolution voted on in public by the members of council. Right. So from time to time, you need to make revisions to give people the comfort level. So while I agree and genuinely believe in the independent nature of any elected official, um, I do understand that from time to time, in a very friendly and cordial way, there should be conversations about how we can improve the operation of that uh, entity, uh, the, the elected officials that have the responsibility and duty of these various offices. Um, we've done it. So that's why I asked the question, not to give you the impression that somehow, although some people think the mayor and the council president and city council is in charge of the world, we're not that, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, so that's why I asked the question. And yes. if there are some things that need to happen, I think the citizens will feel comfortable if that was made public. Because I know I've talked to you all and some things, the ideas you have. So, And council um, president, we're not we're not looking to just continue to manage and keep things the same way. It's about right. continuous improvement of this department. And, okay. I, and I think uh, uh, the members of council, um, in taking a look, will see dramatic changes over the last four years, not just in terms of our hiring practices and the diversity of the department, right. but what we make available online now on our PhiladelphiaVotes.com website, which is an incredible resource for voters, for election board workers, for, um, for people interested in, in anything election related. When I first got involved, I'm sorry for this tangent, but, but this is, okay. I think, important, an important motivator. When I first got involved in politics in Philadelphia in um, 2005, 2006, I called the city commissioner's office because I just wanted to know how many registered voters there were in the city, which is a pretty basic question. It's the most basic question that anyone could ask of an election office. The first question I was met with was what my party affiliation was. Not that it would change the answer one way or another. And the second question was why I wanted the information. It's a big motivator for us to make sure as much information as possible to as many people for whatever reason all of the time. And our website has really been uh, a vehicle for that. In, in terms of additional changes, I think Commissioner Dealey has been an incredible addition to the department because she's bringing not only a uh, background in, in, in constituent service and public service, but also new ideas that even though I've only been here for four years and Commissioner Clark has only been here for, for eight years, is uh, a welcome additional voice. Absolutely. Thank you. And I would just like to say also that, you know, we do recognize that the public does look to us for, for change. And, we you know, we certainly are interested in restoring the public trust, as, you know, you and I have discussed. But I think that there's no greater uh, barometer on this, the work that we're doing collectively than this past election where we saw you know, very few problems, unlike uh, the news that has been reported in other cities uh, throughout this primary season. I really think that um, the job the staff did and a seemingly uh, problem-free election is a great uh, indicator of our willingness to work together and to collectively um, 
bring this department, you know, to the level that the, the constituents and the citizens of Philadelphia um, right. deserve and respect to have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, in our mission, as I created a book, um, trying to make the public fully aware of what our duties are, uh, I began my book with saying that the mission of the Philadelphia City Commissioners is to administer voter registration and to conduct elections in accordance with federal, state, and local election laws. Functions of this mission include, but are not limited to, maintaining the accuracy and currency of the data imaging and paper documents in our three files for approximately 900 93,329 registered eligible voters in Philadelphia County, preparing district registration poll books for use in determining voter eligibility at the poll polling places on election day, maintaining boundary maps and descriptions for the 1,686 voting divisions in Philadelphia, locating accessible, accessible, accessible and suitable polling places within each of the city's 69 wards, uh, which is handicap accessible now. Uh, main, uh, maintenance service and preparation of approximately 3,700 electronic voting machines, certifying federal, certifying the office elections returns for Philadelphia. Okay. All right. Okay. I've been dominating the mic for a little while. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilwoman McKeonis Sanchez. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, Councilwoman. First, I want to ask you about language access. As you know, we passed a charter change um, that by law requires a language access plan. Notwithstanding the interpreter situation that is court mandated, has the Commissioner's Office developed a language access plan? Excuse me? Mr. Last stuff you said. Excuse me? I missed the last thing that you said. Notwithstanding the interpreters and all of the stuff that's been court right. um, uh, d uh, directed, does, has the city commissioners developed a language access plan? We were now, work since the, the new administration came in, and it was one of the key initiatives of the new administration, uh, we're working with the administration on how we can do that in a more comprehensive way. So far, it's been a matter of, I think, two things. The first, which you mentioned, which is making sure we're meeting our obligations, our legal obligations, to provide everything that we produce in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. and also to extend beyond that to the extent that we can not just additional things um, being made in Spanish, not just an interpreter program, um, but greater outreach. Um, that's something that we've been doing more with the, the mayor's um, new office of, of um, multicultural affairs. Um, but, but also, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have with this is, as I know you're aware, is our election board, uh, our election board workers at the, at the neighborhood mm -hmm. level. We provide training for them. We can't force them to attend training. And one of the bigger frustrations is making sure that they're sensitive. Why can't you force folks to go to training? I'm sorry? Why can't you have require people to go to training? It's, it's something that we took a look at in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, they don't work for us. So we, they get paid through us, but they're independently elected. They're independently court appointed. So we can't hire them. We can't fire them. We can't move them. We can't, okay. we can't okay. do uh, any of that. But stressing that in training to make sure that when someone comes in and they're unable to communicate in English, that they're able to use the, the language access line. We provide a cell phone for that purpose um, is, okay. is you know, part, of our, part of our training to make sure our election boards are sensitive okay. to those needs. Um. So you're working on it. I, I want to get through my time because we're going to uh, get through here. Why is it that we place Spanish ads in mainstream papers? So we've asked, I remember you asking this question I in know. 2012. <laughs> and I remember you asking this question in 2013. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and each time we've gone to the city solicitor's office to ask, because of the cost associated with it, why exactly. not just advertise in English in an English language newspaper so you have more resources to do more advertising? And the city solicitor's office, their opinion was that it would be a violation of our, um, uh, of our requirement to do everything that we do related to, to voting in English and Spanish. So while that's one of those things that, 
could not seem more kind of self-evident. <laughs> Once we talked to our lawyers in the city solicitor's office, they said that we're required to produce them in English and Spanish everywhere. Mm -hmm. By federal produce, law. For, federal, by law, yeah. By federal regulation. And have we asked the feds for a clarification on that? I can, our, our department can follow up with the city okay. solicitor to, right. to, to ask. We've, we've asked repeatedly. I'm going to ask that always, every year until we figure it out. Because always to give the inquirer $15,000, you can run an ad in every single Spanish language paper. But that, okay, yes. that's <laughs> one. Um, Ideas. You talked about, you mentioned earlier around election boards because they're independently elected. Is it state code that people are required to run as Democrats or Republicans in the minority party for the election board? No, they can run as for a minority party position, uh, any position, or the minority inspector position. They can be any party whatsoever. So, but, you'll, but the judges of elections all ha all say Democratic in their petitions. So there's there in the primary mm -hmm. um, it are Republicans and Democrats, and then you can circulate a petition in the. Um, in the, it's during a, a period of time during the summer to appear on the ballot in the general election to run against the Republicans and Democrats. So just like it is for Senate or governor or But if they're else. a nonpartisan board, is that state code? I want to know. It, it's, it, go, it goes counter to the notion that we have a board of elections right. that it, is neutral when you have to identify and run with a particular party because I think it adds to some of the partisan debate. It is, and, and really, in reality, it's not a nonpartisan board, it's a bipartisan board, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you have more than Republicans and Democrats, it's more than bipartisan. We have people who have run and been elected as Green Party uh, election board workers, Whig Party election board workers, yes. every So if somebody wanted to run as a Green Party in the primary, because the Green Party doesn't have a line, they would have to get the required signatures Absolutely. or it could only be in the general. You're and right, the threshold right is pretty, pretty low. Pretty low. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's real low. We should talk about that. So let's go back to our voter assistance. Um, as you know, I testified last year in front of the judges, not that they could do anything about it, and we talked about the tracking of voter assistance. Has the commissioner's office promulgated any new regulations about um, maintaining the data around voter assistance? On voter assistance? No. So we keep records of any time. So the election boards are required mm -hmm. to keep records of any time a voter requests assistance. Right? But it's not reflected and in the voter's file. So it's, it, mm -hmm. it isn't reflected in the voter's file. I'm sorry I interrupted your counsel. The voter assistance, um, is it reflected in the voter's file? There's, there's nothing in the, the voter's file. So the voter files are a statewide system, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing in there that would allow us in the state system to flag something or add something that the voters uh, request so, assistance in Right. So part of the discussion that we had last year was there were 800 voter assists in my right. councilmatic district and less than 100 in the rest of the state. And I asked, do we monitor this? Is there a tracking system for this? Is this an anomaly? Um, so nothing has changed to our ability to track who legitimately needs voter assistance? We, we're, we're not able to um, make an assessment of who is or is not permitted to have assistance in the so when, polling place. So in 2014 let me, let me, let me. and 2015, we had eight times more people doing voter assistance in the seventh councilmatic district than in the rest of the city. So how are we ensuring that in fact those folks need voter assistance? Um, and again, I don't want to make voting more difficult, but how do we, how do we measure that? Well, well, you do have a voter assistance form when they come that. to the table. Okay. I know that people signed, but how do we track it? How do I know? Because essentially 800 people signed a voter assistance that says they're illiterate or blind. Okay. They're signing a legal document that says that. If they're in that, if they're in that division, then that judge of election who allow them to sign for assistance mm -hmm. should have a copy of that in that But division. how are we tracking it to make sure that we, that people actually are required need the voter assistance when you see that level of disparity with, with the norm right. around voter. 
Councilman, Greg if I may. Greg you want to speak Irving. to the microphone? I'm sorry. Greg I'm going to have Greg Irving um, okay. come up and address that question. Okay. I'm sorry, my well, time is up. So, Councilman, Councilman, while Greg comes up, I just want to say that we, we have been um, tracking those more closely and comparing them in similar elections, right? Because we can't compare a DA controller election to the Councilmanic mm -hmm. election cycle or presidential election cycle. And that helps identify at least where these anomalies occur and when they occur. All, all I'm saying is that we're not able to make an assessment based on each individual voter, whether that voter um, should or should not be using an assistance form. So in those divisions where we identify that 70% of the voters voted through voter assist, what kind of additional training or supports are given to that election board because it's not the norm? Okay, Greg. Good afternoon, Councilwoman. First off, uh, on the standard voter application form, there's a box so, which- Identify your name for the record. Just identify your name for the record. Gregory Irving, Voter Registration Administrator. Thank you. On the standard voter registration application, there's a box which the voter can check off and state which they need assistance, okay? Then there's another line where they can put the reason why. And that's an affidavit, so it's a sworn affidavit when they sign it. And when we process those applications, we put that into the system. So the system has a way of tracking people who do require assistance. Uh, what they also can do is at the actual polling place, if someone comes in and they need assistance, there's a form which they can fill out there, and they can have a, someone come in and help them do so. And once we receive those back in our office after the election day, uh, probably about 30 days after that, we process those and add those onto their record. So they come the next election, when that person goes to vote, it's already in a poll book. Person A does require assistance, and with that, they can bring someone in of their choice to help. So, okay, so if I asked you who are all the voters in a particular division that need voter assistance, you would be able to give me that list? Yes, we would. And if that number is way out of the norm with the rest of the city, how do we review that to make sure that that is accurate? Well, when you say way out of the norm, there are some divisions and uh, where there are some language barriers and a lot of those people do fill out the forms that yeah, the polling Yeah, but they say place. language, but mm -hmm. when you sign an affidavit that says you're illiterate or blind mm -hmm. versus language, because when you have bilingual interpreters, so why do I need an affidavit if there's a bilingual interpreter there? But we don't have bilingual interpreters in every division in the city. I'm talking about divisions that are 80% Latino. Okay. Right? It's still a voter's choice of whether they want to use that person or use someone of their choice. That's why that was put into effect to make the voter more comfortable when they do go out and vote. So the voters, so the voters get to choose, supposedly, who goes in with them. Yes, right? they do. And that option is given to them, and that's part of your training. Yes, it is. So if... Who is not allowed to go in there with them? The judge of elections or their union representative. Or so employer. you can tell what? me that no judge of elections signed any of those affidavits? I haven't looked at every single one, but uh, they're taught that and that's the way it should be, Councilwoman. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilwoman. For my next round. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Chair recognize Councilman O. Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, so, we now have online voter registration um, in the state of Pennsylvania and in the city of Philadelphia. And um, in that regard, um, if a person goes online, they, they can only register in English or is there another language available? There are, there's an option where you can select uh, a number of different languages to provide that. We use, uh, also have links on our website if people want to print out a voter registration form, and it's available on our website in, I think, probably a dozen languages. Okay. Is that a link to the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, or is that a Pennsylvania voter registration form? I believe it's the Pennsylvania voter registration. Okay. It is. I'm um, sorry, sir. In terms of letting people know that they can register in 
um, in their native language. Is there any outreach effort with that? Um, so on the outreach end, it's, it's, um, it's one of the more important functions that I think our offices play. And all three offices have been involved in, in a number of events around, around the city, especially events where there are new Americans. Right? And we make sure that the materials are available in different languages. The voter registration forms are available in different languages. Um, and that's, you know, that, I think that's one of the more important roles that we, that we have. Councilman, we um, provide accommodations as requested by anybody that would come into our office for whatever language they would need. You know, we would find a way to make that available to them. Okay, thank you. I just put that within the context uh, from the testimony mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we just kicked off our third annual Asian American voter registration drive. And what we did previous years before the online registration is we actually got the forms from the U.S. Election Assistance Commission that had them available in about a dozen languages, right, from Spanish to Tagalog to you know, Korean and uh, Hindi and Japanese, whatnot. But oddly, it wasn't in the in, in Pennsylvania. It was just that it was agreement between the state of Pennsylvania and the federal government. And um, you know, we have about like sixty volunteers who go out for about a month knocking on doors. So, it's been um, an increase in Asian American voter registration. Uh, you know, it's all non-partisan. We don't suggest in any way to register, but typically from what we've seen, it has been in the past and currently still about four to one Democrat to Republican. Um, I don't know about independent or anything like that. That's the available data to us. We don't keep that ourselves. We don't know how they register. Um, but there, you know, just from you know, the, the, the budget request that you're making, um, is there a ability to do more in terms, in terms of uh, getting folks to register, like outreach, uh, advertising or whatnot, um, to reach out to communities, for example, in foreign language newspapers or radio stations or things like that? One of the, one of the things that we're looking at right now with the I don't know, second generation of our website is to um, make sure that website's available in more than just English and Spanish. There are some websites related to elections that have many more languages. So that's, you know, something that we're, we're looking at. So it's not just a matter of outreach. Then we'll be able to direct people to our website uh, as well, and more people will have access to it. And we applaud your voter registration um, you. efforts every year. We know uh, uh, how successful they are in registering voters. Um, the timing of it is always a little bit tricky because it's, it's in that window of time right before the, yeah, the next election. It, but May is Asian American yes. Heritage Month, so that's why we picked May. <laughs> right. but, but let me just finally conclude with just a statement that, you know, a lot of times when we go out, our volunteers, we, of course, run into people who say, you know, the government doesn't do anything for me. I don't want to register. I'm just helping politicians. They don't do anything to help us, right? That's, we're, that's what we, you know. So it does open up that conversation about how you help your community. Mm -hmm. And it has been effective, I will say, that just uh, communicating or, or communicating that just by registering, you are helping your own neighborhood and your own community because you show up as a potential vote. Whereas before, you know, there's no vote. There's no vote in this neighborhood. But now you have voters and they have identified themselves as Asian Americans. Very helpful for us in just letting the, know, letting the city government know that this is a group of people that are getting more and more engaged in their communities and in what's happening in Philadelphia. So it's very helpful that way. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman Taubenberger. Thank you, Council President and Commissioners. Thank you very much uh, for being here this afternoon. And I have to also agree with uh, Councilman O oh in, in very much that I think we can help our communities by having people registered uh, in all ethnicities, in all parts, in every zip code of the, of the city. The more people that are registered, the, the more important 
uh, it is for their neighborhood and, and doing something for the city itself and working in the democratic system and voting is the cornerstone of democracy, something that was discussed uh, in my family many, many times because my mom and dad came from a place uh, in the 1930s Germany. You, there was one election in 1933 and there was never any more and nobody voted for anything because you weren't allowed to. So I think you're safeguarding democracy. My comment to you is I, I think you're doing a, a very, very good job. I like the innovations. Uh, I think it's very, very important. That outreach is important. I'd like to see more of that if it's possible. Uh, but of course our budget restraints and I have to uh, give uh, accommodations to Commissioner Dealey. She had a number of um, uh, programs at various high schools and that is the start of the tradition of registering the vote. I was uh, fortunate enough to attend the one at Lincoln High School and I know you had several others throughout the city and I just think it's a, a great opportunity for young people to get more engaged and know the system. Sometimes people find it to be intimidating and I can't thank you enough for doing that. And that concludes my comment. If you want to comment back, that's fine, but you don't have to. Thank you. You're welcome. Council President, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you. I just wanted to, I, I forget, and every couple of years we mention it, what our people who work in the polls get paid. Would you update us? Councilwoman, the, uh, our poll workers receive $125 or $130 um, for their election day work should they go uh, to training. Okay. Okay. And I don't think there's a person in this room that would uh, agree that that's enough, right? For, a, for essentially a 14-hour day in a, either a presidential election where turnout uh, is incredible and it's stressful and intense to a DA controller race where turnout is 9%, right. and the day, I'm sure, feels like it's 20 hours long and not 14 hours right. long. Um, so we, over the last four years, we've increased that, um, that training amount, right? Because without an increase in our budget, we've been looking for ways to find savings to encourage more people to, to attend training and then to compensate them better for attending training. Since we can't necessarily always provide pay increases for every election board worker, we want to drive people to training to help with all sorts of issues that we see on election day. Because the, the, the training is always changing and we've revised it. It used to be an old like fold out newspaper thing where you're flipping around and you can't see where everything is. We've now put it together in, in um, more of a PowerPoint presentation. We provide copies of that. We have that available on our website. Um, so driving people, incentivizing people to take training and compensating them better kind of go hand in hand. You mentioned turnout. What did you say our turnout was? So our turnout this primary was around 40 percent and it swings dramatically, right? It can swing from 65 percent in 2008 to 9 percent in, um, in the last DA controller race. But the rollout the rollout is, is very similar every election, right? It's 3,525 voting machines. It's 1,686 divisions around the city. It's when we have a huge increase in turnout, it's how do we accommodate that? How do we accommodate an avalanche of calls coming into our office to help people find their polling place or to answer questions from election board workers or make sure that we're able to dispatch our teams of uh, technicians to fix machines. And one lesson learned from 2012 was to make sure we could expand out the number of calls that we can receive. There'll be at least one time during the day where we undoubtedly will get more calls than we can handle, right? At the very beginning of the day when everybody's showing up to vote all at the same, the same time, it really puts an incredible strain on, on our ability to be responsive. But we've worked with OIT to increase the number of lines we have and to make sure those lines, uh, they, they roll over. You know, line one is busy, it goes to two, two is busy, it goes to three, to make sure that we're more responsive to that turnout. Thank and uh, I would like to add to that, that um, we created a, a lot of new ideals so that people could also use their cell phone in order to find their polling place. Um, 
I introduced um, uh, innovation of technology where you could go to PhiladelphiaVotes.com and push uh, vote and look for your address. Where's my polling place? And once you push where's my polling place, you put your address in a box and that address would bring up your polling place, the name of your polling place, the location of your polling place. And so we put in a lot of new technology in terms of voting uh, that would make um, it very will make it very easy for you to uh, find your phone place. It even provides directions on how to drive there, how to walk there, how to ride your bike there if you want. That's right. Very good. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilwoman McKeona Sanchez. Thank you. Um, again, I I'm very interested in working with the commissioner's office about how we clarify this. I don't want to restrict people's access to voting, but I do want to clean up the perception that, that, that the, of the integrity of people's votes, particularly where we've had scandal after scandal after scandal, and the numbers um, kind of just speak for themselves. When, during the um, appropriations hearing, we talked about the mailing in particular that was going to go out for the presidential election, and we talked about what was going to happen with the data once, once that mailing came back. Do we have an assessment of, of that mailing, how many of those came back? We have, I think, uh, around 20 trays of, uh, Greg Irving can answer this in more specificity, yeah. but I think we have around 20 trays yeah. of those post postcards that came back that range from um, uh, this address doesn't yeah. exist to uh, the voters, you know, deceased or one thing or another. Greg can speak to that more. Councilwoman, so far we have about 77,000 cards which have been returned to us as undeliverable. As I stated to this uh, body before when we came and asked for the money to mail those out, that during the summer we would look up each and every one of those cards and see how, how many of those people actually came out and voted, how many of those people actually or did not respond. Uh, those that come back with stickers on there from the post office saying that they have moved here or there, especially the ones that moved out of town, we will be sending an address verification notice out to them. Hopefully they will respond. If they do respond and tell us that they did move out of town, then we can legally remove them from the voter files. Uh, those that responded by going out and vote, there's nothing we could do with those, okay? Uh, but we will have present a breakdown to your office and to this board sometime prior to you, to you guys returning to session in September. So you're going to do a vote, you're going to do an analysis and do the verification to see who voted and, and who was returned and for whatever reasons in terms of a category. So you, so there, if there are any odd patterns there, because I would think if the post office or others, if they were returned and then people voted, what are you going to do with those? Well, there's nothing we can do with those. Uh, those people are at that address for some reason or another, they just were not delivered. So you won't do a, uh, an address verification for them, but you'll send out a verification for someone who didn't vote? No. By voting, they stated that, that they're still at that address. If our commissioners determine that's what they want to do, then we'll do that. Okay. When, when well, we, we need to continue to have a discussion about that. 77,000, is that more or less than your experience in the past, Greg? Uh, we've never really tracked the number before, Councilwoman. Um, <laughs> Councilman, I just want to add that it's been a very long time since this office has sent a, uh, a notice like this to every registered voter in the city. It's more than a million uh, postcards that went out. So this is an entirely... Uh, yeah, I know. We only do these during pre presidential. The last time we did was, right. a, was a presidential some time yeah. ago. <laughs> and actually presidential primaries. Um, have we explored other opportunities to do voter education mailings through maybe our water department billings and other places? We, we've, this last election, thanks to the, yeah. the help of uh, council uh, oh, woman, Sherelle Parker, Sherelle Parker um, we added uh, uh, PGW and PWD added um, notices mm -hmm. to the utility bills that went out that mentioned the date of the election um, the time the polls are open. And so PPW sort of and PICO did it? PGW and PWD did it. 
Oh, in the we, water department. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And we also, uh, Councilwoman Dealey, in, in reaching out to Comcast, also um, worked with them to put together a, um, at no cost to the taxpayers, a, um, a public service announcement related to the election, when the election mm -hmm. is, the time the polls are open, our website to find your polling place, things like that. So it's a presidential election. We're going to have a bunch of different people doing voter registration. What are we doing to gear up to ensure that we're ready for what may be, hopefully, massive voter registration? We totally revamped, or, or that, that may be an overstatement, we greatly revamped um, the, the, the tracking for registrations when they come in. If you remember, it was one of the biggest challenges we faced in 2012, was we had tens of thousands of registrations that came in on the voter registration deadline. Mm -hmm. And because the department, whenever there are statewide petition challenges, because of the resources that Philadelphia has and because of the expertise of the people that we have, the state will frequently consult and move all petition challenges to Philadelphia. So in 2012, we had a situation where all of our uh, terminals, our voter registration terminals, short terminals, were occupied for weeks with voter uh, challenges to statewide mm -hmm. petitions for third party candidates. That set us behind. So when we came up to the voter registration deadline in 2012, we already had something of a backlog of mm -hmm. registrations before the final push hits. Mm -hmm. So what we did this last primary, with an expectation that this is going to occur again, is made sure we were at zero by the time the, 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 the registration deadline came around. And Greg was on that thing the whole time to make sure that we don't have a backlog before so the deadline So does your hits. budget reflect that potential uptick? You know, we saw, what, 80,000 Republicans become Democrats, 100,000 Democrats become Republicans. Are we prepared for that kind of potential uptick this summer? We are. It affects our overtime, mm -hmm. right, because we had people just this last election. We went into overtime earlier. We had people working late every night of the week. We had people working Saturday and Sunday to make sure that we, uh, we hit, those, hit those numbers. Okay. So it's, it's, it's something we anticipate in a presidential uh, general election. Yeah, I mean, I was one of the advocates who was challenging the state about yeah. being able to get all those uh, folks in the systems because it was yes. not only in Philadelphia but in the counties. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of applications that were sitting. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'm very much aware of that. And then lastly, um, you know, clearly there, there seems to be an interest by, by the commissioners around the proactivity, um, being proactive around education of, of, around the, the elections. Um, you know, you could share with the chair what are some of the education initiatives that are going to take place over the next few months during... Um, will, will be kind of a heated season. What are some of the new things? One, two, three new things that we're doing. Basically, uh, we have uh, we have pam pamphlets and books uh, that we deliver when we all go out to do outreach. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I go to the churches, the mosques, and different other locations uh, uh, doing outreach, handing out books, uh, trying to educate the public about what we do in terms of preparing elections. And um, if people are 17 and they're going to be 18 by the day of the election, of course, you know what I mean, we, we educate them to the point that they can register. A lot of the targeting has been, um, a lot of the targeting has been in, in phases of people's life where, as Commissioner Clark said, they're about to become eligible to vote. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of the focus we've had is on senior centers, mm -hmm. right, where people have moved to an assisted living facility, so they're still registered at their previous address and approaching people there. And really kind of like targeting those change of life uh, points mm -hmm. whenever a person is either eligible or, or um, their address has changed. Councilwoman, um, we sent a letter out to all the high schools in the city um, prior to the primary. and. Uh, I plan to do it again uh, over the summer so that the schools receive it uh, for the beginning of their curriculum in September. And what we've been doing is, uh, with the help of the staff, we've been taking a voting machine out to the high schools or the grade schools, whoever uh, welcomes us, and uh, hosting mock elections and having the kids come up and vote and see how easy it is. And then I do some trivia with them and, 
you know, we go through the voter registration form. Uh, it seems to be really effective, and they really get engaged, especially in the presidential election because of, um, you know, all the publicity around it. So it's been a great program, and I hope to uh, continue it, and hopefully it'll continue to grow, and I invite you to join me. Um, we were at uh, Edison High School, mm -hmm. um, and, and I invite you to join me anytime we're, we're out. Well, we'll send you the schedule. Yeah, no, I'm interested in us, you know, really put, taking the show on the road and putting those machines out there for the, particularly young people. Happy to do it. One last question as it relates to the mm -hmm. election boards. How do we monitor who signs the books and, and making sure that people live within the divisions? How's that going? Uh, you, <clears throat> you have to remember that the uh, um, judge of election mm -hmm. and the majority inspector, they are people who are elected by mm -hmm. the people in their divisions. Of course, uh, we make sure that they get paid but they, of course, do the books, minority inspector, majority inspector, um, and the people on the board who obviously uh, when people come, uh, if the first time they voted, they show the ID. If they've been voting, they don't have to. Uh, if they have, um, if they're registered to vote, uh, they go into the poll book. Um, and. Uh, I'm more interested in are we ensuring that we don't have people coming from outside on that particular day? And I know it's a recruitment challenge, um, right. but there's still certain areas where, you know, we don't have local folks. Yeah, we do have a, uh, a, a bank. Go ahead, Al, Ele like Election board workers, as, as you've stated, are really required to <clears throat> live in the division. When election day comes around, we want to make sure that every election board is up and running. Mm -hmm. right. So there's a kind of priority of needs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If we have a polling place and a gymnasium where there are two divisions there, right? One has a board with six people who show up. One has a board with nobody. Mm -hmm. We need that election board to open and the machines to mm -hmm. begin voting at 7 o'clock. So there's plenty of occasions where will instruct the one board or the board members will move from one to try to cover the mm -hmm. other division as well. And at the end of the night, sign the poll book. Mm -hmm. We've reduced or eliminated uh, uh, a, a situation where people are getting double pay that would sign multiple yeah. poll mm -hmm. books. We now do a check for that to save, to save money. Um, that cost us some election board workers, right? Because mm -hmm. after a while, some election board workers, they've been signing repeatedly couple places. So they're not getting $100 for the day, they're getting $200 for mm -hmm. the day. Um, so we, we manage that change and we're, I think, beyond that now. Okay. So it'd be good to, to see you monitoring if, if there is a, if there's, if there are consistent problems in certain polling locations, it'd be good to know if you're monitoring that, you know, because it's easy to say we don't have anybody in this division, but that's every single election. It's one thing if it's like one election. But if right. consistently there's a pattern there. One of the things that we talked about doing, um, which might help us be able to identify those areas, is surveying our boards when they come in for training, um, surveying them, you know, with regard to their experience on election day, and, and, and surveying them on their experience with the training. And then we'll be able to identify, as you say, areas where we might have a problem where you know we'll have board members who may not raise their hand you know in a public forum at a training session to say you know there's only two people and they're the same two people but they might write it down on a card and put it in a box on their way out of the training class and then we'll have a way to identify that and to identify areas where we certainly need improvement and also next year as we approach the elections of um, our election boards, you know, we are certainly hoping that the people that will run for those offices all live, you know, as required in those divisions. And you, you mentioned earlier, and I'll leave this because I'm taking up too much of your time. You, you made a note that in 2008, 65% of the people came out to vote. This primary was 40, and that during the um, 
municipal elections, now in council races, it was 9%. In, in the DA controller race, Right, it was and that's when judges run. Yes. Six. So we've essentially are electing the most important people to our process during the lowest voting election. And that's when they are eligible to, it's, it, we don't determine who gets to run right. when. Right. Um, and, and that's when they come up in the cycle. The it's during a low turnout election. And the, the comparable numbers that I mentioned, the 65% was in a 2008 general election, yeah. not, okay. the, oh, okay. not, the, um, not the primary election. Okay. I was just giving a, a range from 9 to 65%. Okay. Um, I get that, and I know that's state code, but I think that has an impact with the quality. We keep talking about the quality and the training. And it is, it's it's the, le the lowest interest race that we're asking yes. people to come forward. And thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Council. Chair. Thank Sorry. You. Thank you, Council. And the Chair recognizes Council McGree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had some quick um, questions in reference to um, helping people to vote. Um, I had an opportunity in the early part of this year to go to a voting training program for people who were autistic and trying to get more adults, especially adults on the autism spectrum who have that learning difference and making sure that they um, have the tools and abilities to be able to vote. And they had a voting machine. There were people there, from my recollection, from the commissioner's office. Um, what steps have been taking um, have been taken in that regard for anyone with any type of either physical or learning difference in helping them to vote? And is this something that comes under HAVA? I think there's been a, a couple of things that we've done. One is, and there's a whole range, right? One is working with the Philadelphia School for the Deaf um, and providing training. They are producing a video. Um, um, to assist with, with training um, uh, for deaf voters as well. The, I, I think it it's really goes hand in hand with our outreach efforts and our uh, commitment to continuing to increase our outreach. And what about people with other type of the physical or learning differences other than who may be um, hearing impaired? Mm -hmm. um, we would certainly welcome the opportunity to, to speak with you or any other groups um, to identify that need and make sure we're, we're responsive to it. And uh, we play a role in being responsive to, responsive to that by having forms of assistance. Um, we also make sure that all of the polling places are handicap accessible, which is the law, uh, so that uh, we could address the needs of the handicap. Is, and I'm, I haven't looked at having it some time. Is there provisions in that federal legislation that requires local jurisdictions to provide assistance for people that have either, I know physical um, differences, but what about um, behavioral or other type of learning differences? Well, we'd, we'd be looking to do far more than what we're required to do, right? We move polling places uh, around the city. Uh, it was for a while roughly a, a 100 polling places in elections, so roughly 200 a year just for wheelchair accessibility reasons alone. That consent decree expired, but just because we're not required to do it anymore doesn't mean we don't continue to do it. So I, I think this is a matter of focusing on things even beyond um, beyond what's required. And, and again, we'd welcome the opportunity to, to identify where the needs are to make sure we can be responsive so that every eligible voter is able to vote uh, on election day without assistance if need be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Are there any other questions for the commissioners here today on their testimony? And budget, no. Well, one more personal note. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you. I want to thank our newly elected commissioner. Thank you. All right, former staff and and friend for a long, long time for her uh, first budget hearing. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, today. Councilman. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for your time.